3 John, the walk. 1st and 2nd John are letters warning about false teachers. 3rd John is how to deal with false teachers and how to treat the faithful teachers. So it's, it's a, almost kind of a continuation. Okay, what we learned in 1st and 2nd John, 3rd John is giving us kind of the same thing but a little different way of looking at it. It's changing it from, you might say, here's what you got to look out for and now we're changing over here. Now this is what you got to do about it. So we've got three men in 3rd John. Gainus, a faithful servant at the church John was writing to. So he's the one who received the letter. Ditrophethes needs to be in charge, needs to be first, must be in control. His spirit is to, is to um, be consulted, not the Holy Spirit. He's the take charge guy. It's, he's the guy that says, do it my way. Now, we don't know exactly what his role was in this church, but obviously through, he was a leader of some sort, whether he was a pastor or, I say, or something else in the church, but whatever he was, he was in a leadership role. That's pretty obvious. Okay, and then you got Demetrius. He's the faithful servant at the church John is writing from. He's the one that actually delivered the letter. So we're going to see the contrast between these three. So starting at verse 1, the elder to the beloved Gainus, whom I love in truth. John again is using this whole thing of truth, which it can in turn be point towards the words of Jesus, the word of God, that truth that guides us, which we call the Bible. That's that truth, but that truth is God's word. And now John is saying, this is, I love you in this context. It's not just an arbitrary, you know, boy, I really like you. I think you're a pretty nice guy. No, it's you are faithful to the word. So this is what really thrills me. And we are close. We are totally connected. Now, this connection between from believer to believer, even when they don't know each other, but you know, most of us have experienced it in our lives when we meet somebody for the first time and we find out that they are a believer in Jesus Christ, that there is a connection. It's kind of automatic. I've seen it traveling around the country. I've seen it my whole life. There, there's a connection there. And that connection makes perfect sense because we can understand where they're coming from in so many issues of their life because they believe in the truth of the word. So that's what's guiding them in life. And if the truth of the word of God is guiding them, we have a whole lot in common. When it comes to somebody that doesn't have this, we don't have much in common at all. We might have a little peripheral things, but we don't have any kind of a deep connection. So John has this connection with gayness sanctify them in truth John wrote in John 17 your word is truth John 1 1 in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God just kind of all of these are from the same author that wrote third John how the connection between the word the truth the word of God and Jesus is all synonymous with each other. Verse 2, Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers. Now this is the one of those verses that the health wealth preachers love to look at. Because saying, you know, I, I, just, I want you to be healthy. So apparently God wants us to be healthy. Because that's what it just says. It's kind of a problem here. So you think about it from the perspective of, is John saying, I want your health to be as strong as your faith, or I want your faith to be as strong as your health? Or is he saying something differently here? John is saying, if you look carefully, 
May you prosper in good health. May you have the ability to do what God has called you to do as your soul prospers, as you grow in your faith and your understanding. Because health is necessary in order to, I mean, if a person is sick in bed, there's a whole lot of things they cannot do. John is saying, I just want you to be healthy enough to do what God has called you to do. It's not a teaching on God wants everybody to be healthy. That's not what it is. Verse 3, for I was very glad when brethren came and testified to your truth. That is how you are walking in truth. I have no greater joy than this, to hear that my children walking in the truth. Now I find an interesting thing when John says, I came to testify to your truth. I thought we were talking about the truth of God the truth of the Word of God. John is giving him such a compliment, basically saying that your truth and the Word of God truth are the same. Because your truth is totally based upon the Word of God's truth. He's not saying that you have a separate truth. No, you have that real truth and that's why I am so happy for you. This is why I'm overjoyed. This is why I'm thrilled. Because you have that truth and you claim it. We claim Jesus. Does that mean we are Jesus? No, we claim because of who he is, that he is ours and we are his. So this is why he says, no greater joy. There is no greater joy than seeing a person turn to God, to repent to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to see that miraculous times and things change in a person. For those of us who have actually seen that happening in a moment, there is no greater thrill in the world. There is no greater joy. Now we have connections with lots of people and then not directly, but when we actually are there and directly see it and feel it and are part of it, there's no greater thrill. Now we know it like with our own kids and such, but when it's somebody else, our kids we kind of expect it, so it seems like it's, this is what was going to happen. But when it's somebody else, they didn't know it was gonna happen, and you see it happen, there's no greater joy. And then they walk in it. Not just is there a momentary change, but there is a lifelong change. These are the ones that are true. These are the ones that truly converted, you might say, to use that church term. They didn't just, well, yeah, that, I, I, I know I need God in my life, and uh, I'm sorry that I'm such a sinner, and, you know, I, and generally you'll find that that is more a case of, I'm afraid of dying and going to hell, so I got to do something about that but there is no real commitment. So it goes on for a little while and then it wanes away. Now that little while might be a few days, a few weeks, a few months, and sometimes even a few years. And then it goes away. It was never real to begin with. It was a personal decision made with themselves to change. God was never part of it. Verse 5 and 6, Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they are strangers, and they have testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on our way in a manner worthy of God. Now, in those days, there was a lot of traveling pastors and missionaries. This was a necessity. Here again, we go back to the government that was in control at that time was Rome, the Roman Empire. Prior to the time when Jesus walked on the earth, the Roman Empire came into power and they pretty much contro controlled the then known world. It was a huge and powerful empire. But one of the great accomplishments of the Roman Empire is they built roads and they built checkpoints and garrisons all over the empire. 
And all of these roads and all these connections and all these garrisons were designed so that people would be able to freely travel from here to there. Merchandise would be able to go, trade could continue on, and the troops would have an easy way to get to an area that was a trouble spot. Did you know that our interstate system in the United States was built for the military? Do you know why that there is a um, minimum limit on the height of bridges? It's so that missiles can make it underneath. They were all designed as, first and foremost, as eco economic, but also it was designed by military specs so that military transports would be able to travel up and down them and not be hindered by a bridge that's too low. God is, with the setting up the Roman Empire, you might say paved the way, if you pardon the pun, of having all these roads in place so that people would be able to travel and they could travel safely. Now, the one problem was that they had the hotels. Now, I've stayed in some pretty seedy hotels, okay, uh, over the years. My family knows it and they laugh at me all the time. But anyway, uh, these were much, much worse. Because they were, they, there was a few good ones according to history, but the vast majority of them were not very safe. Um, the stuff that went on there um, is no different than the stuff that goes on in, in some of the seedy hotels in the United States today. Um, so staying at a hotel really wasn't a wise choice. And then it was even worse than it is now. Because at least now you might say you can get on the phone and call a cop. Well, there you didn't have that option. So what they would do is they would stay at people's houses. This was expected. This was, you might say, an accepted way so that a missionary or pastor that's traveling, he would come to a town, would find a Christian in that town, and he would stay with them. And that Christian would provide lodging and food and everything that was needed. That's the way the system worked, and it worked extremely well. So this is what he's talking about. He said, actually faithfully, whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they are strangers. The strangers are these traveling people that are coming, and he puts them up. But then he sends them on their way. Now, he doesn't just say, well, I wish you well, have a safe trip. No, he would provide them with what they would need to continue their journey. More than likely, there would be some money, but there also, to a larger extent, there would be food and, what, and water and whatever was needed so that they could continue traveling to the next point. The average person walking would travel between 15 and 20 miles a day. That was kind of the norm with about how it would go. That's for somebody walking. So, so they would go for one day, they would go to the next town, and they would spend the night, the same thing would happen again. I'm, I'm just so happy to see that you're doing this. And then continuing now, verse 7 and 8, For they went out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore we ought to support such men, so that we may be fellow workers in the truth. Now here is John is also, I think, kind of encouraging. Because they went out. Why did they go out? For the sake of the name. Now it's interesting. Early on, that was a term that was used a lot. See, we would say in the name of Jesus. They just said the name. Now, the reason that they would do that is because these were by the vast majority Jews. Jews would not speak the name of God. It was too holy. So in the same way, the early Christians didn't really want to speak the name of Jesus, who they believed and understood and knew was God. So they would just say the name and everybody would know what you're talking about. It's just interesting. that It was so ingrained. We, we have things that are ingrained in us, and this was so ingrained in them that they would use that. Not always, because there was nothing wrong. They, they knew it, but, but still, it's just kind of like that. It's kind of like, I don't wear a hat in church. Okay, there's no thing that says you can't do that. The Bible doesn't say you can't wear a hat in church. That, that whole passage in Corinthians that talks about it isn't talking about hats. 
Um, but anyway, it's just so ingrained that it feels wrong. So then for me, it is wrong. Same here. The Jews were so accustomed to never speaking the name of God that they would just recognize it as the name. And then fellow workers. This is something that we seldom ever think about, but it's true, a true fact that whenever we work in the kingdom, that work continues on, and then we get a little piece of it. Okay? See, we're part of this big picture. We're part of all of the believers throughout all of history. We're all connected. We're connected, obviously, in Jesus Christ. But then the work, we're connected. See, when we send support to David, and that support is used to reach out to somebody, and that person comes to know Christ, a piece of that is credited to us. We say a kind word to somebody. We say a little this or a little that, and that person, a year later, six months later, hears it again from somebody else, and then hears it again from somebody else, and eventually it gets, you know, these Christians are pretty nice people, really, and I find a little bit more about them, and they come to Christ. We got a piece of that. Everything we say and we do and we give all ties together in God's plan for the people to be saved. That means the opposite is true. That's the scary part. When we don't do something, when we withhold something, we say the wrong thing, we act in a way that isn't Christ-like, we are hindering the work of God. We passed by an opportunity. It doesn't mean a person didn't get saved. We have, don't have that power, thankfully. We can't stop people from being saved. But we can be part of it. And just simply by how we act and how we live and what we do. And then those wonderful occasions where we're at the end of that train and we're there when that person comes to Christ. And then we have that great joy. But accepting nothing from the Gentiles to me is kind of an interesting thing. I'm not sure exactly how to understand it completely because there were times in the Bible where people did accept things, you might say, from Gentiles. Um, so does this mean that they weren't accepting something from non-believers? That's possible. I really don't know. I, I'm not going to try to make up something because I simply don't have a good answer to that question. Continuing on, verse 9. I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. Now here's the other guy. Okay, we're just looking at Gainus and all the wonderful things John had to say about him. Now we have this leader in this church, and it becomes obvious what happens is this guy has his way of doing things. And his way is not right or correct. We'll learn that in a minute. But he was so ingrained with the concept of he was supposed to be in charge that if somebody would come and he didn't agree with what they said or somebody would be in his church and he didn't like what they said or did, he would boot them out. Travelers would come and following the custom that you would invite them into your home and take care of them and provide for them, he'd turn them away. Everything that he was supposed to do as a Christian, and especially as a Christian leader, he would do the opposite. Kind of interesting. <laughs> okay, I'm supposed to, God says to do this, so I'm going to do that. God says this is the right thing, I'm going to do the opposite. And that's kind of what it was. And it was pride. That same thing that came up in Satan. That whole concept of pride. Because I know better than the rest of you. So you better follow what I say because what I say is right. When anybody else says contrary to that, they're wrong and they can't be around here. Now this has happened in the churches throughout all the ages where there has been a certain person that has come up 
come up in the church and has, I say, gotten to that point of having power and authority in that congregation and destroyed it. Um, because they simply were going to do it their way. Was at a church for a while that uh, had a pastor that was one of these people. And there was fascinating how when you look at this I'm so reminded of him because he did anything and everything he could to I'd say to be in charge because he had a really good deal he was paid a pretty large salary by two small churches where he preached once each Sunday so he preached two sermons did virtually nothing else whatsoever received a salary at that time of um, over a thousand dollars a week um, why would he want to give that up and he started getting nervous and worried that people were starting to catch on and he was going to have to you know watch out what was going to happen and because the consistory might not go along with some of the stuff he wanted to do so he had his daughter installed as an elder so that he would get one more vote <coughs> i don't know what ever happened to them um, it was no longer a christian church died it was dead before we left but this is the whole concept of the way this guy was operating the pastor in a true Christian church is on the lowest rung that's the way a pastor must look at themselves I'm the lowest right? because this is what Jesus had the example he set for us he lowered himself and when a pastor or an elder or a deacon or whatever you want to call a leader in a church thinks that they're in charge, there's danger, extreme danger. But it's also something that the congregation itself has to be on a watch for. Make sure that doesn't happen because it doesn't just happen while well, he was this way today and then the following week he was like that. No, it's gradual. It slowly on works its way in. And when you start seeing somebody that's exercising too much authority that always wants the final word in any decision that's said watch out it's time to back them off or maybe even more severe so this is what John is worried about with this guy that you've got to he's a danger for this reason verse 10 I, if I come, I will call attention to his deeds, which he does, unjustly accusing us with wicked words, and not satisfied with this, he himself does not receive the brethren either, and he forbids those who desire to do, to do so, and he puts them out of the church. Now, where it says, if I come, in the original text, that actually can be interpreted a couple of different ways and it's kind of vague it could be if I come or when I come or I'm coming so let's not dwell on that because it's really not I must say of great importance to understand the, the text it's I'm going to call attention to what's going on and I'm going to stand up basically and call them out now normally you might say, we think, well, you do that quietly. Not in a leadership. In a leadership role, a person has the right to get up in front of the congregation and call them out if they're doing something that is totally wrong. They have that absolute right because once a person puts themselves in a leadership role, they are open to public scrutiny. So you disagree with what I'm teaching, you have the right to stand up and say so. Absolutely. You don't have to first take me aside and do it. You may, but you don't have to. And this is what John is doing. He's saying, this guy is, is a major problem, and I am going to call him out for it. Because he's lying, he's twisting words around, he's doing all these things, and he's even kicking people out of the church that don't agree with him. This could not happen. Verse 11, Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does good is of God, and the one who do, 
that's evil has not seen God. John's getting very clear here, saying, Gainus is our example of doing good. Diathrases is an example of doing bad. Gainus has God. The Holy Spirit is in him. The other guy doesn't. Now, that's a pretty strong accusation. Say, no, he wouldn't be doing this if he had the Holy Spirit in him. So he's got to go. Now we got the third guy, verse 12. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself, and we add our testimony and know that our testimony is true. Now he's the one that delivers the letter. He's the one that carries the letter. But we looked back and we saw that it, it appears as though John had sent previous letters and this Diothrosis intercepted them and wouldn't read them to the church. So now John sends Demetrius to personally carry the letter. And the letter is addressed to Gainus, not to the church. So John's seeing to it that the letter actually gets there and is read. Interesting. Verses 13 and 14, I had many things to write to you, but I'm not willing to write them to you with pen and ink. But I hope to see you shortly, and then we can speak face to face. John understands that we got a problem here. There's a problem in this church, and it's going to be a whole lot better if we just discuss it face to face, out in the open, directly. This is why it's so important for us to meet together because we accomplish a whole lot more understanding and learning when we do it face to face. When we start to do it with nothing but the internet, nothing but watching a video, nothing but reading on our own, we're missing out. John understood this and he knew that there was something that needed to be dealt with and it needed to be dealt with face to face. Now, here again, many of us have had situations in our life when we're dealing with somebody that we talk to them on the phone, we, whatever. But it's serious enough that we're going to actually talk to them face to face. Because this is where the good communication comes. Now why is that? Because the way we communicate and our facial expressions say so much. We can use the exact same words in the exact same tone. But we're missing that third part. We're not getting as much communication done. So there's not as much understanding. There's not as much clarity. So John wants to see him face to face. This is how we should deal with people. Verse 15. Peace be with you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. His closing statement. Peace. The peace of God. The friends greet you. In other words, our fellow believers here send, your, send their greetings also because we're part of this bigger family. And then greet the friends by name. I love that point. It is so easy to just look at that and just greet the friends by name. No, it's you bring this greeting personally to each individual in the same way that our God calls us by our name. It's personal. It's not you all. It's you personally John is imitating what God does with his people he talks to a country he talks to a group and he talks to a church and he talks to individuals individually there's the difference face to face when we see him we will see him face to face